I'd like to introduce Jeanette from England, who has multiple sclerosis. Welcome, Jeanette. Hello. Could you tell me when you were diagnosed with MS? The first suspicion was in 1998, when I started with eyesight problems. Essentially woke up blind one morning. Um, husband was working away, so I couldn't... I couldn't do other than go to a local optician. Um, he said he wanted me to go to hospital straight away. Mm-hmm. That didn't happen until the following week. Um, from there, I was referred to um, a, a neurologist, but the appointment took 12 months to come through. So the actual diagnosis formally was 2000. Right. By the time I'd, I'd seen him and he'd ordered the tests he wanted, and um, meantime all the symptoms had shut up. So I didn't really think that much more about it. I, I was fairly sure what I had anyway. Mm. So what symptoms were you experiencing by the time you were diagnosed? Um, at the time of diagnosis, not really anything. Um, I'd had the optic nerve neuritis, which had gone away. That was a temporary mm. thing. Um, but no, I was still walking several miles a day and I got a little bit of numbness in two fingers on my right hand, but again, it was temporary. Mm-hmm. So really nothing. Okay, and how old were you? Um, 34. Okay. So what impact did it have on you being diagnosed? Um, this is going to sound really weird, but it was actually a relief. Mm-hmm. Because since my mid-teens, I'd had strange things happen that would last a few days or a week. And by the time you thought, maybe I should see a doctor, they would go. Yes. And I thought, this is a bit weird. And I I actually thought I was just a hypochondriac (laughs) or going through the normal teenage angst. Yes. I would get spells of dizziness and they're so dizzy I couldn't stand up. And that would last a day or half a day. And then it would go away. Mm. So you think, well, I'm not going to go running to the doctor every time. He's going to think I'm mad. <laughs> um, that's how how it had been. And yeah. I always thought, well, you know, that's a bit weird. And didn't think much more about it. Then when I was in my late teens, I made the decision to, to not go to university straight away, but to join the army. Right. Um, I joined the military police and went all through military police training and service in Northern Ireland with really no problems, except I did notice I used to get very tired a lot faster than other people. Mm-hmm. And that was the only thing that I thought, well, I wonder what's causing that. What, why can they keep going and I can't? Yes. Um, but apart from that, it's, it's nothing. And how did so, you hear about LDM? Um, I had a major relapse about three years ago, coincided with Colin's mother dying, then my mother dying, and the relapse followed more or less straight on from that, and it literally dumped me in bed. Mm-hmm. It was really drastic, um, and I've had a bit of a, a run-up to it. I'd started to find the morning dog walk a little bit difficult, and I was going through a bad patch of repeated dizzy spells that, that didn't lift after a period of time. They just hovered around. Mm-hmm. Um and then I had this major relapse, I was literally dumped in bed. Um, so the GP, my GP treated me for that. Um, and I did all the sensible things, I just rested and, and just let let it do what it does. Mm. Um, about six months after that, I, I, went, I went to see actually an ear, nose and throat specialist because I'd started to get really bad tinnitus and then I went deaf in my right ear. Mm-hmm. So the GP said, well, let's refer you to ENT. He said, because they will look at the whole picture. They won't look down a pair of binoculars, which is what the neurologists are liable to do because you've got MS. Mm. So that ENT consultant ordered an MRI scan. Um, and at the time I said to him, can you can you do more than just the, the oral bit? Um, so he said, yes, well, you know, we'll, we'll do a whole whole brain scan. Um, 
and he he looked at that afterwards and he said, "Well, there's, I'm not worried. You know, I'm quite happy that there's nothing that I need to be concerned about." He said, "But you should probably go and talk to a neurologist for explanation of anything else that's on here." Right. And I sort of leant forward and I said to him, "Like those white spots?" And he he said, "Yes, basically." Mm. Um, anyway, I saw a neurologist about two or three weeks afterwards, and. He didn't say all that much, really. He said, oh, yeah, there's, there's a bit on there. He said, but nothing that would particularly concern me. Um, but he immediately got concerned about the symptoms I'd been having. He said, oh, you know, this this has to be sorted out. You have to do this and you have to do this. And he started making appointments for me, left, right and centre, with continence nurses and all the rest of it. And I... I sort of accepted it at the time when I was talking to him. I got home afterwards, I thought, actually, you know, I don't want that. I don't want that level of interference. Mm. Um, so I cancelled them all, all the points he made. I said, I'll, I'll see the physiotherapist because that could be useful. Cancelled all the rest. Um, spoke to my GP about it and I said, do you think I've made a mistake? He said, no. He said, you're in charge. He said, if you get another urinary tract infection, we'll do a bladder scan. He said, that's easy, do it at the local hospital. So, yeah, I said, well, let's do one anyway. So I did mm. one, nah, normal, no problems there. So but all those symptoms then started to settle down. And I'd been referred from that neurologist to see another neurologist who's taken over all MS patients in this area. Um, and I'd seen the first neurologist privately. Um, saw the second one on the NHS. And I think it was the worst timing anyone could have had. That morning, we'd had one of the dogs who'd had um, a nasty bout of hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. Mm. So we'd had to drop her at the vets on the way to the hospital. And I, I honestly thought we probably weren't going to see her again. Mm. We were kept waiting in a drafty, grotty waiting room for two and a half hours. And there was nobody going in and out of his room. So I think, you know, you start to think, well, what's he doing? Mm. We were eventually called in. He said, oh, come in and have a seat. No apology. This time I was annoyed, to say the least. Um, and his open, opening gambit was, I've been having a long discussion with Dr. Fuller about you, and we've decided that the drug you should take is Tysabri. So I sort of looked at him and I said, oh, said, really? I said, that kills people. He said, oh, only a few. And I'd done my research. I said, well, actually, 11 since April. I said, and if you're one of the few, it's quite significant. So he then sort of dropped the subject and said, anyway, I said, I've heard about LDN because the previous neurologist had suggested I go and read up. So I did. I read up everything I could read. And I discovered LDN entirely by accident um, on the Internet. And I spoke to my GP about it. He read the literature and said, brilliant, I'll prescribe it for you. So I just said to this neurologist, I've been taking it now for, I think I've been on it three weeks at the time. I have no intention of coming off it. Um, end, of, end of discussion, really. Um, and I've been on it uh, three years now. Did you have any side effects when you first started? Nope. No. I had one... I had one bizarre dream. Um, <laughs> I thought it was quite bizarre because I dreamt that my stepson was naked parachute jumping. <laughs> so I thought, well, probably better not tell him about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I didn't. Nothing. Absolutely what, nothing. What has LDN done for you? Um, what I can say definitely is that I've had no new symptoms since I've been on it. Mm-hmm. I've had no worsening of the existing symptoms I had. I mean, my walking is very bad, but that stemmed back really to that relapse. Right. And the thing that really annoys me looking back is that if I'd known about LDN before I had the relapse, I might have avoided having it. Mm. But the damage that relapse did, I think, is, is going to be with me, if not forever, then for a significant time. Um, and walking is 
are very, very difficult at the moment, even around the house. But I think coping with things has improved. My mood has improved. Mm-hmm. Um, How not is your only... bladder now? Pardon? How is your bladder now? Perfect. No problem. That was the thing that right from the start I said to the GP. I said, if for nothing else, I would stay on LDN for that. Mm. I said, because from having, you know, all these, well, not incontinence problems, but um, itchy bladder and feeling that, oh, dare I go so-and-so because, well, that's just evaporated, completely gone. I mean, for people who don't understand bladder problems, it rules your life, doesn't it? <laughs> it Absolutely. Really does. And it, it yeah. was getting that way, but I, it would, didn't stop that immediately. I was on it on it about six months, and then suddenly I thought, That's interesting. hang on, you know, I haven't got any problems anymore. What and about fatigue? Unless I get really hot, um, the fatigue is a lot better. I mean, if I have to stay up, late in, into the evening um, it doesn't particularly bother me right. um, mm-hmm. at one time there was no way I could have done that I would have been absolutely out of it for a, at least a day afterwards um, but our life has changed significantly anyway because Colin has just retired mm-hmm. retired at the end of last year and he spent the whole of last year signed off sick with a lung abscess oh. so yeah. all the time he was signed off I had to to jump in and do literally everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and the stress of him being so ill and the stress of him not knowing what was happening at work, wanting to finish but not being able to make a decision because he didn't know whether he was going to be able to afford to. Yes. Um, that was all very stressful and I knew I would get a kickback from that. Um, and I think the kickback is that was the walking was starting to get better, um, you know, the stress came off and I think I I just sort of let out a huge sigh of relief. Um mm-hmm. and then the walking got worse, which I expected. Um, but we're now we're now four months into retirement and unfortunately he was able to take a, a voluntary redundancy which solves any financial problems, you know, in in mm-hmm. in a sweep. Mm-hmm. Um so the pressure is now off and we just settling down to um, you know deciding whether we're going to stay here move or but there's no pressure anymore oh that's good so what would you say to other people who are contemplating trying LDN I'd recommend that they do because apart from anything else it it does no harm of the people I've spoken to who've had side effects the side effects have been very very small Mm-hmm. And usually short lasting. I've yeah. got one friend who's who started on four point five milligrams. Um and I spoke to her a little while ago and she she was having problems. Um, particularly problems sleeping. I said, Well look, drop down to three. Mm. And she dropped down to three and she's been fine on that. And but strangely I've stayed on one and a half. Okay. I, mm-hmm. I take the liquid and it's one one point five mil is is what I've stayed on. It's you. Oh, that's good. Because I tried to tried to up it. I got to two and a half, and uh, I think it started affecting the sleep pattern a little bit, so I, I dropped back down again. Mhm. Um, but I, I feel absolutely fine on one and a half. Well, mm-hmm. thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. I do appreciate it. That's no problem. So, how many more people have you got to interview?